Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline Kite, and on behalf of Imagine New South Wales, which stands for the Emerging Architects and Graduates Network and the Australian Institute of Architects, we would like to welcome you to this evening's talk in conversation with artists. The Emerging Architects and Graduates Network is a platform in which to create a community for the younger generation of architects for mutual support and to foster a culture of architecture. It is also a great opportunity to connect and engage with practices and practitioners beyond the architecture profession who are working to contribute and improve our built environment. Before we begin the main event, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. Public art is a key component of most major developments in the Sydney CBD, in buildings and in the surrounding public domain. It plays an important role in our civic spaces as it inspires inclusivity and humanizes and enlivens our built environment. We are very honored this evening to have an exceptional panel of guests with Barbara Flynn moderating the discussion. As public art curator to local and state governments, educational institutions, development companies and architectural firms, Barbara has facilitated some of Sydney's most prominent and remarkable public artworks. Barbara champions the artists she works with and places great importance on her relationships with them. Artists are engaged early in the projects, which facilitates a more meaningful and considered work that is ingrained within the public space that it inhabits. Joining Barbara for this panel discussion are four brilliant artists. They are Agatha Gosnape, Nell, Thea Anamara Perkins, and Yuani Skets. The discussion will focus on the contributions these artists are making to art, the importance of family and community, what it is like to work in community and public space, and how art influences the way we experience our cities. Before we begin, please ensure your microphones are turned off for the duration of the talk. Any questions for the artists can be sent through to the chat box at the bottom of your screens for discussion at the end of the presentation. I will now leave it to Barbara to take this event forward, and we hope you all Thanks very much, Caroline. Uh, I wanted to also thank the artists. Um, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary group that um, is speaking with us tonight, and say that what I'm going to do is really try to, you know, get them to talk and also to talk among ourselves, to run this like a conversation. And I want to start by introducing each of the artists briefly and asking them to speak for three minutes about a preoccupation or a project that they're working on currently that is, you know, really of great interest to them at the moment. So Thea, if I could start with you. Thea Anamara Perkins is an Arente and Kalkadoon woman uh, with a, an emerging full-time artistic practice, grew up in Sydney, still based here and has very strong ties to the Redfern community and also Maparante, Alice Springs. It's been a big year for Thea. She was awarded the Alice Prize in March and shortly thereafter, the Australia Council First Nations Emerging Artist Award. And you know, in discussion, Thea can talk more about the project that she's working on for November uh, as part of the support of that award. Uh, I got to know Thea more closely. I've known Thea for you know quite a few years, but very much more closely this year. And it's been a great pleasure. She really has opened a door to a whole new world for me um, with a trip that I made with Sarah Slattery, managing director of the quantity surveying firm Slattery's to Maparante Alice Springs in March. Uh, Thea is working on a project with five of the extraordinary elder women artists of the Tonganjera artist community. And Sarah and I were able to visit um, to actually select some works that are now part of a Slattery Sydney new headquarters art collection. I was very moved with, by the way, Thea 
works with the artists. Um, it was extremely fascinating to see how their paintings are affecting her work as a younger artist, but also her sensitivity, her, her sense of appropriateness, her sense of how to be in the place and how to be with them and how to learn uh, was really quite extraordinary. Also Tarnanji, the great annual exhibition and art fair that the Adelaide Art Gallery of South Australia mounts every year. Uh, Thea was a participant along with the five women artists. And there was a panel that I got to take in with Betty Conway, Yinta Donald and Thea, which also demonstrated Thea's great sensitivity. Just the way she spoke with the women was really quite extraordinary, very moving and extremely respectful. So, you know, Thea, I don't know if you want to talk about those portraits that you're working on or maybe the project in Alice Springs, but would you mind just taking a few minutes to tell everybody, you know, about something that you're working on that's really exciting to you? Uh, thank you so much, um, Barbara, for your kind words and that um, wonderful introduction. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose land I meet with you today and acknowledge the other, all the other amazing um, panel members who are really amazing women. So thank you. Um, yeah, well, um, the, my, I guess, <laughs> uh, a work that um, I'd like to um, talk about and that has sadly been postponed um, due to COVID, but um, with borders opening back up, I'll be going back up to the Northern Territory to, yeah, to do the Dreaming Project. And that project is in many ways um, linked to the ones that I did with the Tunganjiri, Tunganjiri ladies for um, Tanandi and um, for um, the Slattery um, collection. And it's about uh, reprising the kind of um, visual language of the 1970s and 80s and the pro protest posters in order to kind of regenerate that beautiful spirit. Um, and yeah, and it will be created through doing workshops with, um, up with the town camps. I don't know if um, everyone's familiar with Alice Springs. So, um, the town centre is bordered by town camps and they ha all have kind of different family groups and communities. So we'll be working with them. And the idea is to, um, yeah, go to the source and empower people's voices and make that into a cohesive, you know, kind of visual language. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. We'll come back to that. It sounds like an extraordinary project. And Nell, um, Nell, uh, I've known for a long time and, you know, just personally, it's been ex extremely exciting to watch the evolution of an artist's work over so many years, pretty much since I got to Australia in the late 90s. Um, her practice is an extremely embracing one, you know, that encompasses concept, performance, art, and, you know, very recently also works for the public domain with the South Everly Treehouse work. Um, that was made in a pretty extraordinary way with very close connection to the community. Uh, people, as many of you might know, you know, I went in and forged, but community, anybody could sign up by the internet to help forge leaves for the treehouse, which is now there uh, for everyone to visit and, um, you know, kind of commune with one's childhood or an extremely evocative work. Nell's also an extremely dis, you know, distinguished artist who's in, whose work is in most of the Australian museum collections. She's been in several of the important seminal exhibitions like the National New Australian Art in 2017, the Adelaide Biennial in 2016. And recently, she just let me know today about a project that Station is partnering with O Media in Melbourne during the lockdown as a, as a kind of way to do something for the people in the city during these, you know, really difficult times. So now maybe over to you. I think that's the project that you'd like to talk about. And I can also pull up some images if you'd like me to. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to um, also acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose land we meet and the amazing panelists. Um, Thea and Agatha are both my studio colleagues. So um, it feels, um, yeah, like a different way we're meeting than we usually do in the studio. And that's so, the carriage works, I should have said. Yeah. yeah. So we're all at carriage works. So yeah, at this time, apart from uh trying to keep calm, um 
I have been yeah making some uh, these posters that have their paintings that Station have scaled up and um, put on bus shelters and all around the city of Melbourne uh, with some other of their artists too. And then the other project that I've been focusing on at this time, which in some ways grew out of doing the public art at Everly, was to um, oh Barbara's just going to show some of the uh, bus shelters. Um, sorry. You're right. Um, is to do, I've been doing a community quilt project and I was supposed to be in New Zealand um, doing this project and it's a project that was very easy to make migrate onto an online project and um, a bit like a virus, it spread, you know, and so there were groups of people who would make it amongst themselves and they'd tell someone else and then so all these uh, beautiful patches where people have embroidered uh, a woman's name, a woman who's had meaning to them, and then I'm going to sew it all together next year. So, and then the images that I have up are these that I, you know, mentioned in the introduction. These uh, images, actually paintings of yours now on bus shelters, and in one <laughs> instance in a station in Melbourne. So let me get out of that. So now everybody can uh, stop share. Here we go. <laughs> I should be a lot more adept with the Zoom, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm getting there. Um, thank you, Nell. I'd like to now draw you in, Agatha. Um, Agatha, I mean, I really have just have great pleasure also to be working with Agatha on a project. And also I worked with Ioani on one uh, last year. Uh, Agatha, is an artist whose practice spans improvised and procedural performance. And I love, I love the way you've written this, visual and public artworks. Uh, her recent exhibition at MoMA, the Monash University Museum of Art was just an extraordinary experience for me. Um, last year, besides that show, Agatha you know, had another at Perth Institute of Contemporary Arts. It was a big year, she was also an artist commissioned by Caldor Public Art Projects on the occasion of the 50 years of Caldor's project uh, to make a special commission. The exhibition in Melbourne had one, or one extraordinary feature to it, which was a new work, which was really at the frontier of what artists can be doing. Um, you know, with technology in this instance, something that was made with the Google Lab, uh, 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 you know, an immersive work that everyone could participate in um, and very much a very even sort of balanced collaboration between Agatha and Google Lab, which I found extremely fascinated about, fascinating about it. There's a great book that came out um, in conjunction with ex that exhibition called The Outcome is Certain. It's co-published by Monash University Museum and also Perimeter. And uh, I should also say there's a new book on Nell in the Thames and Hudson series as well. Um, Agatha and I have been working with others, with her gallery representative, Amanda Rowell of the commercial and a wider team, Doug Knox uh, engineer, um, on a project that Agatha has titled The Noblest, which will be installed in the BVN Greenland Center next month. So imminent and very exciting. It's a phenomenal project which showed me very directly because you know, in this case, I have the honor of working with Agatha how Agatha goes about making something, something a significant work for people, for the public domain. Um, it takes water as its subject. Uh, that site is the former Metropolitan Water Sewerage and Drainage Board. Um, in every way, in, in every profound way, it's linked to site, but also transcends that. I mean, water is obviously a very important issue today in Australia and in the world. So Agatha, over to you, um, you know, I, if you want to speak about that, great, or, or whatever um, you might want to say in a couple of minutes until we get into a conversation with some other questions I have for all of you. Thank you so much, Barbara. That is a very, um, I just have to take it off when I see my face. That is a very um, generous introduction. So thank you very much. You're um, welcome. To acknowledge the Wongo people um, on whose land I have the absolute um, honour of living for the last 40 years uh, on, the, on, the, on the edge of the Parramatta River here. Um, thank you also, amazing to sit amongst such incredible artists. So great honour for me to be here. Um, 
I thought rather than speaking to a particular work, Barbara, sorry to go a little bit off a script, I just wanted to like think mm -hmm. about something that just came to me as I was driving home. Um, and it's about, I guess, why art is quite, quite an interesting thing to have in the public domain and why the public domain and the public um, have a very particular relationship with public art. And, and it's also why I am really interested in doing public art, even though I find it quite uh, daunting, a huge honour and a huge privilege, but also a, an incredible challenge. And I, and I was just, and I just realised then it's because it is a point of a dynamic mediation between an incredible heaviness, and that's the heaviness of temporal permanence, it's the heaviness of material permanence, and the heaviness of incredible visibility, um, tempered with, and what I hope to bring to it is the lightness of spirit that art has this amazing capacity to, to hold. Um, so... I was just thinking about that and so for the for me as a, as the maker or a co-author of the work because often public art comes out of incredibly complex and um entangled relationships um you know that is a very exciting dynamic to be able to sit inside and and try and find a way to temper those two things that the threat and the burden of the the heavy and the and the, also the risk and the danger and the flightiness of the two light and, and always doing a dance between those things. Um, and for the audience, I guess that is the challenge too. How do you, how do you come upon something that is either permanent or semi-permanent um, and, and build a relationship with it over a duration of time or also over a single glance? And, and I think we're, we're all negotiate, negotiating those things all the time as both the audience and the um, and the, and the maker or whatever I am. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with just that broad statement, Barbara, and see where it <laughs> Thank you. There are a lot of kernels in that that we could talk about endlessly. Thank you. So Yuwani, to introduce you, um, Yuwani Scarce is a Kolkata and Nukunu artist um, born in Woomera, South Australia. And your practice, Ioani, is definitely interdisciplinary, exploring political nature, aesthetics of glass, which you've worked with for many years and also photography as a document. Um, and very importantly, you know, of course, the ongoing effects of colonization on Aboriginal people. At the time that we were working together on the project for Central Park, you were embarking on a major journey, really, I would have to call it, um, traveling the world to visit memorials. Um, and, you know, I hope very much that in this conversation you might be or might be able to say more about that, you know, memorializing the missing and the dead. Um, later in the talk, I think we'll talk about things like how artists do depict very difficult subject matter like trauma. Um, Yuwani is also, I mean, really, it's just such a pleasure to have you all together, but just, you know, extraordinary achievement. Uh, Yuwani, uh, prestigious the Yalingwa Fellowship in 2020. You worked with the Architects Edition Office Melbourne to make the NGV Pavilion, making a work called In Absence last year, which I saw, which was an extraordinarily moving experience for me. And again, it would be great to hear more from you about that work. Uh, you are an awardee of the Kate Chalice RAKA Award uh, for your contribution to the visual arts in Australia, the Indigenous Ceramic Award by the Shepparton Art Museum. And, you know, I have to say, really working with you and Agatha, they've been just great experiences for me, you know, really among the best, maybe the best that I've had with artists. So the project of Ioannis at Central Park is called Ectopia. It's in the Foster and Partners Commercial Tower, which is now the home of the UTS Graduate School of Health uh, and a most extraordinary work. And in absence, again, is the NGV work. Um, over to you, Ioanni. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's a, such yeah, a wonderful introduction as well. It's um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here with everybody. And I would also like to acknowledge um, the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurong, um people of the Kulin Nation and where I live and work actually. And um, I acknowledge their, their elders past and present and future. And uh, also, 
I'd like to um, acknowledge any Aboriginal people that are with us today, including um, Miss Thea um, as well. So, and uh, I've known Thea for a while, and uh, particularly because I have a long-term relationship with her mum, Hetty. So, uh, and, and I'd also like to acknowledge my elders um, from the Gugutharunukanu people, particularly the women in my family. I have a, a, a long line of strong women within my family. So um, hence probably, yeah, that's where my gutsiness comes from, I guess. So um, yeah, love them very much. So um, I guess, um, yeah, like I'd, yeah, I'd, would like to talk a bit about in absence because um, it we yeah uh, edition office and I um, started that conversation while I was travelling um, uh, internationally with my uh, colleague uh, Lisa Radford from the VCA. So we won a research grant to uh, participate in research uh, through various sites internationally. There's too many to mention at the moment, but it's sort of, it was um, parts of the former Yugoslavia uh, massacre sites in the US, uh, particularly uh, Wounded Knee, which is quite a significant story for me. Um, and so, and uh, other areas of nuclear colonization. So it was interesting when uh, Kim and Aaron had approached me to uh, work with them on submitting an idea for the project for the NGV Architecture Commission and we were talking a lot about the importance of architecture and how it can address issues or be storytellers as well so um, and we talked a lot actually via FaceTime and sharing documentation with each other um, about uh, the infrastructure that Aboriginal people had built and still remain today actually after thousands of years so um, so an absence was a yeah I guess the um, yeah the birthing part of it actually so that with that story so it's a, a nine meter high ten meter wide wide I guess um, a structure made out of black uh, Tasmanian timber and uh, there's two chambers with sixteen hundred glass yams of mine that uh, seep out of the the walls of those chambers. And um, it was a place particularly for us that uh, was a guardian for stories that was built to, to uh, maintain those stories and also to celebrate and acknowledge uh, all of those smoking trees and um, various dwellings that Aboriginal people built. Mm. So, and um, yeah, I think that's, that's about it for now, I guess. So. No, that's great. Thank you. I mean, I did um, see it actually a couple of times. And also there's a wonderful um, segment of Away, the radio program, mm -hmm. where you and the addition office architects are speaking. And in that, I think you described it as a living being with a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think we, we believe that it is, it sort of, it, it draws you in and it, it actually embraces you as well. So it's, it, I do believe that they, they do become like uh, they are alive, I guess. And from what I witnessed overseas as well, uh, they are, um, I think, because human interaction with it actually gives it that energy. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I think we had a lot of love and respect for, for that work. We still do. And it's like an old friend. Yeah, and um, that's great. Yeah. I think I'm just going to get going now. Thea, can I ask you, um, I remember, you know, doing an interview with you as I was, you know, trying to write about this lettery collection. Um, and you've talked about how portraiture, the way you're doing portraiture is a way of depicting Aboriginal people from an Aboriginal perspective. And the fact that you are painting these ladies, um, you know, is a, is a subject. Can you just speak more about that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, well, you know, because it is um, such a kind of, um, portraiture has such a long history and it's such a kind of venerable medium. So, but I always think that, you know, it's, you can always bring something fresh to it. And I think that there is something, yeah, interesting and fresh of, as being a young um, Indigenous person and, um, yeah, 
and painting these ladies, but also it kind of allows me to express what I want, what I see and what I, um, and how I feel about these women, my country women kind of, and, um, but, and it also kind of lets me um, put, you know, add to that narrative, you know, and then put these really kind of strong positive images into that narrative, which I find very powerful, like a powerful thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. And, you know, the idea of how uh, you all can be working with your families. I mean, you want you talked about your, your, the women in your family, um, Nell, you worked with the community on Eveli Treehouse. Could you just talk about what, I mean, what was the, how did that come about? How, how did you come up with the idea of drawing in so many people? And what was it like to collaborate with so many people, so many, you know, strangers really, members of the public on a work? Yeah, maybe you could share the photos of the treehouse while I'm if I can. I just tried, did, what, did everybody see Ioannis? In absence or not, I think I'm failing terribly. <laughs> Actually, I might I might ask um, Caroline or Tiffany to do the slides after all because I seem to be kind of hopelessly distracted <laughs> and just keeping the conversation going. I'll try again anyway. But you start and I'll try again. Okay, so the tree houses are at South Everly and they're two uh, interconnecting pods, and they've their face they've actually got eyes and a mouth, so the uh, door is like a mouth that you go through and um, that face comes from the character of the door and the windows at Carriage Works and Everly and Everly's got a mirror image of Carriage Works on the other side of the tracks and so as a starting point I had this lovely family history speaking of family my great-grandfather worked there as a boiler maker and my great-uncle worked at uh, Carriage Works as a draftsman and uh, my great grandfather, in a very real sense, he job shared and during the depression, so worked one week on, one week off, and that kept my family alive during a very hard time. And so, um, my family history is not something I was particularly interested in at all. And so, this public artwork gave me the chance to really investigate that. So, with that knowledge of uh, my family in my heart, I took my nan's. Um, bird feather she had this bird called bluey and I took my nan's bluey feathers and I just sat under the gum trees until the face and the spirit of this um tree house came to me and on this site at Everly there is the oldest continuing Victorian blacksmith in the world and uh, even the Smithsonian come and do research there and it's run by a really great guy uh indigenous guy Matt Meburn and he um runs classes there and so it just seemed like this really it just all coalesced and yeah this is some of the classes I was pretty excited about getting a high-vis shirt with my name on it I think um you know these kind of forums are great and being articulate about one's work is definitely part of the job of being an artist but I have to say I think I'm a blue collar girl actually you know I love getting in there and getting dirty and um so the, in terms of the community workshops, um, over 24 workshops, we had over 400 people come in and they were from literally all walks of life. Um, my artist colleague friends, Barbara came to guys who worked at the Redfern Trade Station, members of the Commonwealth Bank who were going to be working at the precinct, um, all ages, nationalities, and we were all there for this uh, common purpose. And it was incredibly, um, yeah, humbling and it was so much fun. And, um, yeah, and it was amazing that everyone's leaf was beautiful. Like we didn't throw any away, you know, and just that it's the same as there's a great Zen saying, um, there's not an ugly leaf in this world. And um, in terms of people making it, that turned out to be very true. Thank you. Agatha, I mean, your father is an artist, and I think there's one incident uh, now where you're, you're probably kind of in juxtaposition working on a project together. But I mean, just again, this idea of working with family, um, you know, or with community more loosely, would you be able to talk about that a bit? You're on mute. You're on mute. As Nell was just talking, I was thinking about that beautiful expansive act of um, collaborating to make those beautiful leaves. And if I just talk for a moment about the 
this the noblest of the elements which is the mosaic that is I've been working with Barbara on which is very incredibly um uh, I, I would say site specific in a very um particular way because it's responding to the the very particular nature of this semi-private public arcade below this brand new um, incredible apartment building designed by BVN, commissioned by Greenland in the centre of the city. Um, it's adjacent to, I won't, uh, yeah, so in terms of the family connection, um, when Nell was talking about holding that feather, that was so beautiful because I mean, that's the best feeling when suddenly the art starts to like weave and way, weave its way around and start to make itself. Um, so my, and this is certainly not, this, this didn't make itself, many people made this work. Um, earlier, I, um, about two years before Barbara offered me this opportunity, I was, um, my paternal grandmother, Margot Snape had just passed away. And she was a very uh, esteemed graphic designer, but also um, watercolour marbler and calligrapher. And her practice, particularly her act of calligraphy and scribing is incredibly uh, resonant in my own work, but also in my father's. And you can really see a line of typographic interest, which is kind of separate to design and typography, but something about the written word being written by the hand flows through us. Um, and so, of course, I recognise her, but I also recognise my father in that lineage but so after she died I um we had her catalogue of marbling which now resides in the national library but at that time I the marbling is she always used to say to me when she dropped the pigment on the meniscus um that was we, we weren't at all a spiritual family in any um religious way but she said that at that moment that's when she had a sense of the 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 way the world was held together and the meaning of the world because the pigment pigment had its own relationship but made this incredibly, this moment beautiful. And this relationship between the surface of the water um, and the pigment and her marbling like simmered to the surface as I was trying to think about what to do in this site, which was adjacent to the um, water, uh, the, it's got a long name, but the waterboard building ultimately, which is also a beautiful art deco building. And suddenly all these kind of things started converging. And uh, one day I was standing outside the building thinking about the Wadward building and this new building that was going to be next door to it. And I saw above uh, the, the door a, a steel frieze, uh, no, bronze frieze by uh, Stanley Hammond, a sculpture, a sculptor in maybe it was made in, I can't quite remember the date now, but part of the original commission. So very, you know, early public art in the 20s. 1939. 1939. So in the, in the, um, in the, in the phrase, there's a quote from Pinder very appropriately, the noblest of the elements is water. And so in this work, I've taken, taken that language, which is on the outside of the building and brought it inside and um, somehow made it as if my grandmother was marbling those letters and those words um, and, and made them merge. But the most amazing thing is that um, we had to find a material that was incredibly robust because it's an indoor, outdoor space. Um, and it's also above the, it's very huge, this work, 17 metres long and sits in an arch above the head, above your head. And, um, and I started thinking about all the beautiful tiles in the Art Deco building next door, the Waterwood building, which is now the Primus Hotel. And also about all those beautiful tiled Art Deco-esque tunnels in Sydney. And originally I wanted to make it out of tiles, but more and more it seemed like I was actually trying to make a mosaic. And um, we built a beautiful relationship with Travis, Travis Anuto, this incredible um, mosaic company based in, um, what's the town, Barbara? Uh, oh gosh, Speltenbergo. Yes, Speltenbergo. Um, and which is also a family lineage of mosaic making and um, worked very closely um, to find a way to articulate uh, my grandmother's marbling in mosaic using the materials um, that they had at hand from Italy. So here you've got beautiful um, cut marble Murano glass. And I'm very excited about it because my son was like, so it's a marbling made of marble. And it was just this beautiful play of materials keeps unwinding in this work. Um, and yeah, we'll see what happens as it's installed above the head. But, you know, I am really interested to see the resources that we draw on as artists in these moments. Um, whether they're expansive or uh, come from an internal 
um, resource, uh, a lineage that, um, you know, you, you have to find ways to be present with, yeah. No, that's very beautiful. I mean, the project, the kind of multi-layered nature of it, Hammond also won a competition in a way you did as well. And the, there was a panel which had um, the director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales at the time, who also was involved with the David Jones, you know, Art Gallery, which was big at the time. This is way before my years in Australia. But the panel's official statement, I think, is so extraordinary and so beautiful. They said, pure water is the best of the gifts that man to man may bring. <laughs> I mean, what a, fab I mean, an art panel, you know, I think that was pretty interesting. <laughs> anyway, but again, Agatha, the way you took all these elements, I mean, he was commissioned, you're commissioned, you looked at the frieze, it's a quote from Pindar. Um, and also the materials. I mean, I think um, one of the questions I had sort of proposed to all of you to think about is this one about materials. Like in what I do, I like very much, and it's important, I think, in every project that we actually end up finding a new maker for everything. You know, an artist will have some idea and we kind of figure out who the best person is to make it. And the works, I think, as a result of that, or it's a big factor, they all look very different mm -hmm. from one another, but it's also been a beautiful way to, you know, kind of utilize this great capacity of makers in New South Wales, Australia, but in this case, also Italy, you know, finding who the, the best fabricator would be. So this traditional method and then Nell, you know, the blacksmithing at that shop, which is the oldest remaining blacksmithing shop with the profound Matt Mewvern, um, you know, still running in a young man in a really vibrant way. And then at the other end, Agatha, you know, you, what you did with Google Lab. Mm. Um, so, you know, it is, to me, this has been sort of an interesting, there's just so much possibility, um, so many ways to take an artist's idea. And I guess what I like to do is try to assist people to figure out how to make things, at least at the beginning of a project. I guess I can interrupt for a moment, Barbara. I just, you know, thinking about the lineage of um, my father as well, you know, making steel sculptures in the city of Sydney, basically throughout the eighties and nineties. Um, you know, he would say that that resistance, the material gives you at those moments is actually how you generate the, the, the work. And it's really interesting working in this way with delegated labour, working collaboratively with other um, makers and craftspeople and artisans and artists that, you know, how do we, like, I guess the challenge for me is always how do I find that point of resistance and that dynamic tension as I'm engaging in a way where I'm not holding the materials and, um, you know, and that's, that's what bring, brings the beautiful life Ioanni was talking about before, this, you know, a very... Um, that, you know, touch, you know, coming into presence with the material really um, changes it. But is, you know, my, my question is always, is that possible when, that, when the tasks are, you know, the fabrication is beyond your reach? And but I think it is. And I think somehow the energy travels through it, but it is really interesting to always be alert, but not alarmed of how that could fall out. Yeah. Yeah. And also I find that sometimes these, um, you know, factories or whoever they are, they've never done this before. And it's such an extraordinary reprieve for them from what they might be a little bit tired of doing, mm -hmm. which often does mean, you know, a lot of excitement and, and terrific sort of application and energy that they bring to it. And that can all be very beautiful to see as well. I wanna maybe move into a different arena a bit. I think there are probably a lot of architects in the audience tonight and, you know, again, thanks to Caroline and Tiffany for inviting us to do this for this in this context. And, you know, quite a few of you have worked with architects. And I wondered if, I don't know who wants to jump in, if anyone, but, you know, just talking about what that's been like. I mean, obviously, you have less control, I suppose, than you might have when you're, you know, the cliche in your studio. I mean, what did you learn? What kind of positive things came out of the process? Is there anything you do differently in the future? I mean, Yuani, your relationship with Edition Office seemed to be a profound one. Um, I mean, I picked that up seeing the work and meeting them, but also, as I say, reading about and listening to that AWAY program, maybe you could start. And just, again, for this audience, what is it like as an artist to work with architects, maybe particularly when it goes very well? Yeah, um, 
I think, uh, yeah, Kim, Kim, Aaron and myself have been asked this quite a lot because um, I think with the NGV Commission as well, it was the first time that an, a, a collaboration had happened that won, won the commission. So, um, and we, yeah, we, um, yeah, we, we got along really well, I think. And I think when I touched on it a bit beforehand was um, we were given that opportunity to just keep talking about um, how the work was going to materialise the ideas and things like that. And I think Kim has a, um, a artistic background, um, so he, he was um, aware not the saying that, our, you know, like um, all three of us were, like we were aware of how it could work together. So, and um, and so it was, there was just a lot of talking and um, a lot of respect for each other and a lot of uh, listening as well. So, mm -hmm. and um, we always knew from the beginning um, uh, what it was going to be, I think, like it uh, it did um, end up taking on a mind of its own, um, but we always sort of knew what the subject matter was going to be. So um, it was, it, for, me, for, for me, it was really easy. It was an easy process. Um, and it was something that we talk about quite a lot and we want to continue that working relationship in one form or another later on. So, um, it's something, um, yeah, I've found, um, yeah, quite heartwarming and very, um, yeah, I love them very much actually. So, and I, I said to them once that um, I was going through the process of uh, knowing that once the work was up and, um, and the commission coming to an end um, that, yeah, uh, leaving that, um, uh, I guess those uh, days of talking every day was, um, yeah, a process of leaving that behind, but um, it's, it hasn't actually completely finished. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, and like Nell, in your experience, was the working with Architects Cave Urban with Evely Treehouse, was that, I mean, complete, like a co-design or, you know, where did you end, where did they begin? How did that work? Yeah. So um, just to backtrack, I love working on things just all by myself in the studio at a scale that only I can, you know, deal with. And then I equally love um, working, collaborating with others at a scale I couldn't do or with skills that I don't have. And I've always made other things like mosaic and tapestry with the tapestry workshop and uh, light works, neon works. So it was very natural for me to um uh, work at this uh, putting a team together um, but this was of course a much much bigger uh, team that I had to put together and Cave Urban had um, great skills with um, community workshops too because they uh, make a lot of their work out of bamboo their more artistic side of their art architectural practice and so um, yeah I learned a lot of acronyms wow in architecture oh a lot of acronyms but it was great because it was like there's the artist and then there was um yeah the architects there's the property developer there was um carriage works who were the commissioner and then all the general public but yeah arborists engineers as you all know how how many people it takes to do these things so i mean apart from the 400 odd people who were volunteers there was at least 100 more involved and I had done some projects before at Mona, which were like had the police and bagpipers and truck drivers. And I, I love it all. I love working with all different kinds of people. And what you just said to me, Barbara, oh, said before Barbara really resonated that you need just finding the right people for the job. And um, yeah, that they also respond to this opportunity to do something that they, it's outside their parameters too which makes it incredibly challenging but incredibly rewarding. And that was my experience. Right. No, I, I believe that. And Thea, would, is this something, I mean, can you imagine or visualise your work on a monumental scale? I mean, I have ever since, you know, meeting the Tonganjira artists through you, I've been 
trying to think, um, you know, of ways that their work could possibly be brought into these large scale projects, you know, whether there would be any way to do that. But have you thought about that? Is that something, and I'm just going through some of these really extraordinary portraits of, of Thea's. Well, I think it's something, um, yeah, that I definitely um, think about. And I think it'd always bring an interesting um, element to the works, seeing them at scale, but also kind of, I guess, um, yeah, they're like, they're kind of the various, the very serious kind of themes that they um, deal with, but then, you know, and then what happens when you put that on scale, but also that, you know, that their vibrance and optimism. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Sometimes I think that maybe um, scale is not necessarily big either, you know, scale might be about a very particular relationship um, that you have or a very, you know, and that could still be a form of public art. And mm -hmm. um, perhaps, you know, that's what's changing. Maybe I, perhaps, you know, public art can take many forms, not just necessarily the, 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 what we understand as monumental, which has its particular cultural hues anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah, totally. And even in this kind of like COVID era of the digital kind of dissemination of um, various forms, it is, it, they do take on their public, life and it's about yeah it's a beautiful thing it's about um you know making connections and story and common commonalities you know i think a good example of um i guess the anti-monumental would be the tracy emin work the distance of your heart you know city of sydney project um these 68 bronze birds like you know you could hold in your hand uh and tracy talked a lot about the fact that it was anti-monumental um and I think that took a certain courage actually, um, you know, in the central city of Sydney, that was a city of Sydney project. I think Bridget Smythe might be on the call, but you know, the public art running under Bridget Smythe as design director. And I had the pleasure of uh, acting as curator uh, for the city center with them. It's a role your mom has too, Hetty, or sorry, Hetty has for Eora Journey. Anyway, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that was interesting to me that it was, you know, that Tracy, frankly, had kind of like the bravery to do that. And um, maybe that, I just thought, I thought it was a very interesting way and, and obviously no question just as valid. She liked to talk a lot about getting away from the bombastic, you know, these big things all over the place. Um, yeah, so now I think those are interesting considerations. I, I wanted to also talk a little bit about, um, the role of, or ask you, not talk, but ask you about the role of advo advocacy and politics in your work. I mean, if it does have a place, that comment earlier, you know, about, you know, Yuani, the journey you made, and maybe you could tell us a bit about that, to look at these memorials to the missing and the dead. And, you know, how does an artist express trauma or, you know, injustice, um, dislocation, uh, I would say, uh, Yovani, about the work that you made, Ectopia, for the Foster and Partners building at Central Park. It's a multi-layered work. I mean, I stand in that lobby sometimes and I think the people going to work don't have any idea really of what it is, or at least they may not be accessing its deepest level, but it doesn't matter because it's a, you know, it's an extraordinary red 700 element suspended work. But of course, there's a very deep meaning to it. Um, and I can pull up images, but I mean, I think everyone would love to hear about the trip that you made last year. Yeah, yeah. If you wouldn't mind talking about that. Yeah, so um, so it, it, it began um, in uh, the US actually, because- Did you? Um, hello, Tanya. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, and uh, because I'd been taught, I'd been researching memorials um, ever since I graduated art school and, um, and I had frequently visited Berlin, um, which I call the Memorial City actually. And, uh, and it was through um, my working relationship with architect Mikhail Roderick actually, and um, who introduced me to a lot of the um, 
uh, memorials in the former Yugoslavia. So I felt like um, it was really important to um, keep that conversation happening, I think, um, by visiting uh, these sites of, um, of uh, significance, actually, of trauma. And so uh, we, I think, uh, and then I asked my colleague, um, Lisa Radford from the VCA to travel with me. So we've, it's currently called, um, the project itself actually is called The Image Is Not Nothing in Concrete Archives in Brackets. And so it was about um, looking at how many um, countries were uh, dealing with uh, sites of genocide and war, uh, nuclear trauma and nuclear colonization. So um, uh, it happened, we, we traveled, uh, I guess, um, over what could have been considered three months, but split over um, three trips. Um, and so, uh, and so we um, often dro or like dro uh, drove by car and um, visited, uh, I guess, uh, I think 18 countries, I think drove 10,000 kilometres. Um, probably, I probably got that wrong, but, um, and uh, I often, it's like a time frame as well. It's like a timeline. So I have to remind myself of where we've been. We took, I take a lot of photos as well. So I have a sort of visual diary on my phone. So, um, and it was, yeah, I talked a lot about, um, the, the importance of acknowledging um, what happened here in Australia to Aboriginal people during the frontier wars and that lack of acknowledgement that is still happening, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so this project itself is something that's gonna be ongoing for a, a number of years. It's currently online at the moment. Um, we're co-editors for Art in Australia and our, uh, we were invited to um, produce um, an archive online um, as part of their online journal. So that will complete in December. And then an exhibition will happen um, in February. And um, so we're bringing together other, other, other artists from Serbia, um, Germany, Australia as well, First Nations people as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's something that's, I feel like it's, uh, I'll continue to create work about until something changes here in Australia. So, where will the exhibition be held? At Ace Open in Adelaide, and um, it will open at the end of, I think, on the twenty seventh of February, mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, it'll come back to Melbourne because um, originally it was meant to open in Melbourne, but COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So and so there'll be a series of symposiums and people from overseas that we, we we met along the way. So the travel will continue um, once things settle down. I think as well. So yeah. And when I spoke earlier about the um, you know what I would describe as the multi-layered uh, nature of this work, this is Ectopia. What I've been talking about at um, you know, Central Park. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think also Agatha's work, your work, this, the multi-layer, but also this extraordinary, you know, close connection and the sophistication of these works conceptually. You know, for example, this red definitely refers to blood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, and this was to be the UTS Graduate School of Health. You know, there are all these tight correspondences but also, can you talk about the caliper forms and what they are, Yuani? Yeah, so these, these um, represent the calipers that were used um, by uh, Norman Tyndale to measure the circumference of um, Aboriginal people's heads. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been reading about him quite a lot because um, anyway, like he's, I've made work about him before, but I think when I was, when you invited me to make a work for this space, as soon as I walked into um, the foyer, I think um, it was 
pretty obvious to me uh, what the pieces were going, what the piece was going to be, I guess. So, and um, and also to make a statement about um, what happened to Aboriginal people, and uh, and you know that it wasn't just about measuring our bodies and um, it was taking our blood, our saliva, our skin, our hair, and some of them are still in the collection at the South Australian Museum. So because Norman Tyndale, um, he did a lot of research throughout Australia so on Aboriginal people and the, uh, the missions, the Christian missions that these people were living uh, well, not even, I wouldn't even say living, that were sort of held in, were told to make themselves available to him. So it was under duress. So for me, it was something, red was very, a very new colour for me because I'm, uh, I make, my work is very minimal in colour, but um, and it's always one or the other. But this one, I think because of the, the concrete um, in this foyer was, um, you know, I love concrete. I think it's a beautiful material um, that there had to be something that was going to coexist with that. Yeah. And also the shadowing, which, you know, aesthetically is extraordinarily beautiful. But again, I think it does, you know, the idea of a shadow. Mm. Again, the, the levels of meaning of this work are, are many and very extraordinary. And I think, you know, if someone visits over and over again or goes in and out of the building, I think eventually you do start to grasp what it is about. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, been interesting. Uh, you know, sometimes when I drop by, I think I notice that in people who are the regular users of the building. I mean, it's obviously something that art in the so-called public domain can achieve. Um, uh, this sort of, you know, profound experience or maybe someone suddenly understanding something. Mm. Um, I mean, we never, I don't really agree with didacticism with these works. So there, there is a plaque set into the paving, but it just gives your name, the title of the work and the year that you made it. Um, mm. And I think someone who wants to know more would figure out a way to figure out more. Mm. Um, so it's very elective and, you know, requires a bit of work on the part of uh, someone looking at it, which is also, I think it's, you know, mm. the thing that kind of a challenge. So I wondered, I, I'm going to wind this down because I think there will very likely be questions. Um, but also, I just wanted to invite you all maybe to comment or, you know, like say anything, add anything that you'd like before Tiffany and Caroline open it to the floor, so to speak. And thank you so much for everything that you've said and contributed tonight. And I want to apologize for myself not having acknowledged the Gadical people of the Aura Nation. I was resting on what Caroline said at the beginning. So would anyone like to say anything at all or should we just go right to um, questions if any have come in? Maybe it's time for some questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm conscious of the time. So I'll just Thanks, uh, read out a few couple of questions. But thank you everyone for um, the presentation tonight, it's really inspiring. Um, so we got a question from Christian. Um, so I think it, it talks a bit about, you know, the introduction, Barbara, where... Um, we were just talking about the importance of engaging the artists early in that design process. So if it's a new public space or building. So Christian says, um, <clears throat> quite often the public art elements associated with commercial developments are separate to the building or applied to the building after or later in construction. What ways do you see that this could be possibly a more integrated approach? Um, art that is perhaps built into the building language. Um, so if anyone's got any thoughts about that. I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really hard work. But it, I, frankly, I think it does take someone. I think curators are very important, um, mm -hmm. and I think it does take someone who's a sort of advocate and very constant through the process. And it's really hard work. Um, it's important to be in early. It's important to, um, you know, it's a it's a joint decision. It'll be a committee decision, but to identify an artist and to um, 
help them get started as early as possible. That's often a kind of, you know, argument that I'll have or discussion that I'll have with a company. Um, you know, leaving too little time never really benefits anybody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, I guess my position is I won't do a project if it's not possible to have certainly an integrated, you know, to use that word, an integrated possibility. And I'm, and you know, it can be really tough. And I protect the artists. That's very important to me. Actually, um, probably the the setting up of the working relationship with the artists and making sure that they there's a really kind of very good communication between them and the architects. Extremely important relationship. And also with the commissioners, whoever they are, whether it's the city or the state or a company. Um, yeah, so sort of navigating that and kind of, you know, like a puppeteer or something, making sure everybody's talking with one another. Yeah, um, I think, Iwani, you touched on it um, when you were talking about your work with Edition Office in absence um, and that you had begun those discussions before the work was created. And I think the final work itself is quite powerful. I haven't actually been there, but I've just seen the imagery of it. And I, I watched a video on the NGV website. And um, yeah, I just think the concept was so strong. And the art itself seems to be equal to the architecture, not, you know, the art applied to the architecture afterwards. Yeah. And that was really important. It wasn't just, um, you know, architects inviting me to just put something inside it or. It was always a, a, a collaborative um, idea and that it was meant to be one, not one or the other. Mm. Yeah. So, um, but you might get to see it. It's, um, it does, it, what I should mention is that it, it, uh, it has found a permanent home. Okay. So. Um, Are you allowed to say where yet? No, not yet. No, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, we've been waiting a long time, actually. So it's uh, it will be announced um, uh, in the middle of October. So oh, right. yeah. Congratulations. yeah, Do we have to go to Victoria for it? Pardon? Do we have to go to Victoria? I uh, can't say. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did have another question. I think. Um, both Penel and Agatha, you're talking about the process of working with um, different um, craftspeople. Um, so I just uh, wanted to understand a bit about the process of creating the work um, in the built environment. So obviously if you're in your studio, you have that freedom of um, the creative process and doing what you want, but then when you're building in public space, you're dealing with regulations, um, the constraints of materiality and stakeholders. So I guess, you know, does this provide, like is this creating restrictions on your work or does it provide opportunities to your practice? Um, just interesting to hear a bit about that. Uh, can I say something quickly now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking then like, um, I guess all those things you're, you're talking about are about the physical aspect of being responsible in the public space. And we are trying to bring that responsibility in all ways. So, you know, being responsible for what we do, being responsible for what we bring visually or conceptually or politically to the public space. And I think to have to address all those constraints, which sometimes seem for me incredibly um, technical and overwhelming and um, create a lot of resistance and irritation in me, but actually they're a necessary that it's necessary to to be in the real world and and you know that's the thing about making public art it's necessary to make that commitment to the the restrictions and the regulations of the real world even if they are seem very counterintuitive but yeah Nell <laughs> Nell who made a beautiful thing that children have to play on which I think is the ultimate challenge to regulations <laughs> well that regulation is a uh universally accessible and intergenerational, not a child's playground because the regulations would have been too tough. But um, I agree with everything Ag just said and I think the best of public art is when it feels like it's not mine anymore or the artist anymore, it belongs to people. And so, yeah, you just let it go into the world and those regulations 
they just fade away after a while. You know, it's the work that lives and the kids that play on it and, you know, people who have their lunch there and enjoy it. I think we'll just um, have one more lighthearted question at the end. Yeah. Um, so Tiffany just asked, um, what public artworks, buildings or spaces capture your imagination? Maybe if each artist wants to say just quickly their own. I can find that because I always like the mural at the Crescent in Annandale. So, and I'm a fan of um, mural, Australian mural artists from Sydney in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And um, I'm constantly, it's still there, although it's been um, pretty decimated by West Connects at the moment. But to see, to see um, how images can res connect to emotion so strongly is very amazing for me over time, over a long duration. 40 years, yeah. Wow. Um, for me, it's it's um, it's the book burning um, memorial in Berlin, mm. and for some reason the artist's name has left my brain. But um, it's for something such that is so uh, intimate and um, is in the ground and is very minimal. It's it's so emotive. So I, I get quite emotional every time I see it. It's called um, it's called Library Bibliotheque. It's by the um, artist Misha Ullman. That's right. And yeah. it was put in. I think it would have been on the fiftieth anniversary of the burning of books in Babelplatz, which is where it is in the ground. Mm -hmm. Really extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, actually, just about the Berlin monuments, um, or you know, the 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 conscience, the genocide of the Jews, um, I've always been struck by how they don't have any identification for the most part. They're not plaques, you know, saying who did them. Um, and I've always thought that was exactly right. And there are many, many works around the city, you know, that you just come upon. So it's like really part of the fabric of the city, but anonymous, you know, but made by real artists. And that, and that one is a really extraordinary one, I agree. Okay, the first public art I ever loved was the big pineapple. <laughs> the, big cow, the big banana, the house of bottles, the big shell at Noosa, and I used to collect all the postcards and I was in love. And then you can see it in my work, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, one that comes um, to mind for me is actually one that you worked on, Barbara, the Jenny Holzer that's in the city. Yeah, and I think that's really such a beautiful strong work and so and I love it because I get to see it all time at all the time and it really kind of like strange and different times and it's kind of a lovely thought that it's always um you know streaming away um and that um yeah it's all um Aboriginal texts and so it's that you know that beautiful kind of um union of voice and presence and yeah it's just really beautiful yeah you know I think it is too Great. Well, I think we might wrap it up there. Um, I also wanted to just say congratulations to Thea for being a finalist in Archibald Prize. Oh, thank you. I'll try and get down there and have a look at your work. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for your time this evening. It's really inspiring. It's interesting to hear about, I guess, the process from the artist's side, not just the architecture, because that's all we seem to deal with as architects. Um, and Barbara as well. Um, for your time in preparing this great talk and also for your great work in championing some amazing public art in the city. Thank you.